This podcast is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Nothing stated on it either by its hosts or any guests is to be construed as psychological, medical, or legal advice. You are listening to Adoptees On, the podcast where adoptees discuss the adoption experience. I'm Haley Radke. On today's show, guest host Lizette Austin speaks with Kendra Malnachuk Potter, actor, yoga teacher, native adoptee, and subject of the documentary Daughter of a Lost Bird. Kendra shares her powerful adoption and reunion story about navigating identity issues while claiming her cultural heritage and what it was like to reunite with her biological mother, family, and community as part of filming a documentary. Kendra also talks about the painful and abusive U.S. policies around Native children and adoption, how she practices self-care while integrating the reality of generational and historical trauma into her personal story, and much more. There is one mention of sexual assault in this episode. We wrap up with recommended resources for you, and as always, links to everything we'll be talking about today are on the website adoptieson.com. Let's listen in. I am so pleased to welcome to Adoptees On, Kendra Milnichuk Potter. Welcome, Kendra. Thank you so much for having me. It's a true pleasure to have you here. So let's just dive right into the meat of the matter. Um, I'd love it if you would start by sharing some of your story with us. I was born in 1980 and was placed for adoption at birth in Portland, Oregon. And uh, my bio, it was a closed adoption as I understand most adoptions at that time were, but a very, very domestic adoption. I was born in Portland and my parents also, my adoptive and biological parents all lived in the Portland metropolitan area. I went home at three days old and grew up in a relatively affluent white community. I am a native adoptee and didn't know that, but it was it was what was happening. And it wasn't until I was in high school that my parents let me know that I was possibly native. It was unclear in the course of the adoption because my birth mother was also adopted. Then uh, when I was 18, I talked about looking for her and my mom kind of talked me out of it because I had a younger brother who was also adopted and she was concerned that it might create some conflict um, that he wasn't going to be able to find his birth parents right away. And so she asked if I would wait until both of us were of age, which seemed reasonable at the time. Though I did feel annoyed by it. Um, (laughs) And then, yeah, I don't know. Uh, Fast forward a lot of years and I was living in New York City. And my brother actually found his birth parents before me via Facebook. And I, I started looking for my birth mother like a couple of days after he and his birth mother made uh, contact with each other. And it was like this very funny, sweet. I always knew I was adopted. It was always a part of my my knowledge of myself. My parents, It was like a bedtime story that my parents told from day one. And my mom still like when we're on vacation and I say goodnight to her, she'll like pull me in the bed and tell me the story of how I came to be a member of my family, which is very nice and a little bit weird. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> but I always knew. And part of the story that I had been told was that when my parents took me to the judge's chambers to sign the adoption records, my dad like sleuthed. They, they had a plan and they were my mom was like, I'll distract the judge with the baby and you look at her original birth certificate and see if you can get the name of the birth mother in case she ever wants to know. So they had this like whole it's very he's very Mr. Magoo. The idea of him like sleuthing around a judge's desk is funny, but he got a name 
that later on proved to not be the actual name. Oh no. So that's unfortunate. But um but I wrote a letter uh, a couple of days after after my brother found his birth mother saying, "May I please like I just want to say thank you for my life and um I don't want to intrude, but I also, you know, would be open to a relationship. And if you are not my birth mother, please let me know so that I will know to continue looking. And if you are my birth mother and you do not wish to have any contact, also totally cool. Ball is in your court. Just like, thanks. And I mailed it, ironically or not, on Mother's Day. I like stuck it in the mailbox on a Sunday and then realized like after I put it in, that it was Mother's Day and was like, oh, that's weird. Wow. I know. And then five days later, got a missed phone call from a 503 area code while I was working and left no voicemail. And the phone number was the number that was associated with the name that my dad had looked up. And I thought, well, probably she heard my voice. Like, that's weird. Leaving a voicemail must have been awkward. Maybe she like called and then heard my voice and it all got real, super real and was too much. So I thought surely they'd call back in a couple days um, or later or I don't know, something. And I never heard back and thought maybe this is it. I should just abandon the idea of reunion and it was hard. And my partner felt pretty strongly that I shouldn't abandon it. And so he and I had some awesome arguments outside of restaurants about whether or not whether or not the story was done and I should, you know, close the book. Yeah. And then a couple of years later, I made a film. Now we're at like 2012 uh, with a woman named Brooke. Peppy and Sweeney, who's Blackfeet and Salish, and we became good friends. And she was deeply committed to me having an understanding of where I came from and was convinced that if we just like started asking around, we would find out where I like find my my biological family. And at the time we had thought that I might be Inuit or some Alaska native based on information from my adoption records. Wow. Okay. <laughs> or something that that had been written down by the aid, the adoption agency telling my parents, like my birth mother thought she may be Inuit. So Brooke was like, let's just go to Alaska and start asking around. And I was like, What? And she, and she was like, you don't understand Native communities. We like keep track of things. And if you just ask, someone will be like, oh, yeah, yeah. So we joked around about it for a while. And then I got pregnant with my daughter. And suddenly having answers became about something more than me. And I wanted my kid not to know, not to have as many questions as I did. So I agreed. And it was not that hard. We just called the adoption agency. And <laughs> my birth mother had just filed the paperwork not that long after my daughter was born, saying that, which I hadn't understood initially, but both of us independently of one another had to, with these closed records, had to say, yes, I would like to meet her. And I had to say, yes, I would like to meet her. And then we could connect with one another. So we both filled out the paperwork within just a couple of months of each other, which was interesting. And I found out that I'm actually Lummi. Uh, I come from the Thlactamish people, which is up in near what's currently like Puget Sound, Bellingham, Washington area. And I wrote her a letter. It took me nine months to write the letter, which I think is kind of interesting. I worked on it almost every day, drafting and changing and on, on the subway, like rewording and thinking like, what would what would I want to know if I 
did if it was really a traumatic experience giving this child up for adoption what would what would be not re-traumatizing or re-triggering what how much information is too much information to give and how can I express my gratitude in a way that that didn't feel like I was demanding anything of her and then I sent the letter and it took her six months to write back and then um, a few months later, and then I think there was maybe one or two more letters back and forth that were closer together before I called her. And meanwhile, my friend and uh, filmmaking buddy, Brooke Sweeney, was documenting this whole project. So uh, I have the awkward and amazing gift of like a well-edited story of my reunion and that journey became a documentary called daughter of a lost bird and it was this really and still is this very uh, challenging process of my personal journey of learning more about where I came from and also learning that in context with American policy, governmental policy, and how, and like the shape of Native identity as an adoptee, two generations removed from her community. So yeah, that's, I don't know, the nutshell of my adoption story. Love it. Well, I mean, it's a lot there. And um, thank you so much for just sharing, you know, that that arc of what it was. And yes, I've seen the documentary, phenomenal documentary. And that was actually one of the things I wanted to ask you about was just what was it like to, you've already touched on it, but to have this whole reunion and all this learning you're doing unfold in front of a camera? Well, I'm an actor. So being in front of a camera is not that unfamiliar or um, awkward for me and it's very different when it's not a narrative scripted story right so um, I I think it helped a lot that the filmmaker or the director of the project was a very good friend of mine and really you know I have some native friends but only a few certainly when we started making the project there were there were only a couple and so she really was almost like like playing auntie at the same time uh helping helping me navigate that process it it wasn't and i i think i still am not fully understanding the like the process of reunion and not only reunion with my birth mother but also uh, this very long and slow process of reunifying with my community has been th- like the camera was was not a big issue. If anything, there were times that I think I would have stopped. I know there are times that I would have stopped had I not agreed to do this project. It was like scary and hard and having a commitment to complete a film kept me going And as I'm becoming slowly acquainted with more relatives, I am realizing that there are like definitely some feelings about making a film that I didn't fully understand at the beginning. Um, So that, you know, that's that's part of the process. But the but the the making of the film and the journey back are like so deeply intertwined for me that there's there's no really separating the two. Yeah. One would have died without the other and vice versa. It's like Siamese twins of <laughs> reunion and art yes. um, having to be related for me. Well, and it really it really was art. I mean, watching watching the documentary, I was just feeling so grateful to be able to see it and struck by the art of it and the skill in which you know, she she captured your experience and edited it in a way that not every single thing was told, but it, 
but so much was told, just that art of tell- good storytelling. And I was just really struck by how you really were, you know, doing this in this very kind of knowing it'll be public way. And you said that, you said that in the documentary that you were like, maybe I would have stopped if this commitment wasn't in place. And you just repeated that now. So I did find that really kind of compelling for me personally, as I'm going to be doing some documenting of some DNA travel I'm doing and trying to reconnect with my ancestral places. And so just that sense of like, this is a very internal journey I'm on. And I'm at the same time, kind of simultaneously putting it out there. And, you know, so I really appreciated seeing your journey in that way. And thank you so much for being willing to share it. Um, Because I do think there was such benefit, there's so much benefit to seeing it unfold. Thank you. I mean, that's, that's definitely the hope. My hope is that the film is a jumping off point for dialogue in a lot of different audience or for a lot of different audiences. Yes. So And the title. So Daughter of a Lost Bird. Can you explain the Lost Bird piece of it? I know it's in the documentary, but I think for right now, if you wouldn't mind explaining Lost Bird and and yeah, why that's in the title. Sure, sure. So Lost Bird was a native child who I I am so embarrassed. I don't remember which tribe she was from, but um, her family was massacred by the U.S. armed forces. And she was adopted by the general who led the battle and named, her name was Lost Bird. And there is a history in the United States policy navigating what was called the Indian problem uh, in the westward expansion, where the Indian adoption project was a policy of taking children from their parents. And this policy happened throughout the first half of the 20th century. And that generation is called the Lost Birds. So my birth mother was born during that time and as a native adoptee would fall under that lost bird generation and when we were talking about for a very long time the film's working title was Kendra which I knew was not (laughs) going to be the final title ever ever but while we were kind of batting around ideas I realized that I thought the the it felt like a poetic name and really was helping to sort of look at my story in context to U.S. governmental policies. Yeah, it really is a perfect title in that sense. And the fact that your mother, I think you said this, but your mother herself was adopted. So therefore, um, that that's another layer of complexity to the story, right? That Yeah, absolutely. That you reconnect with your birth mother, and she also had to do her own reconnecting, being a lost bird herself. Yeah. And so that actually I was and still am sort of a perfect example of the intention of that policy, which was to separate people, Native people from their communities and basically, or not basically, literally written in intention was kill the Indian, save the man. And um, I grew up with no knowledge of my heritage. So for all intents and purposes, I'm I'm an example of uh, really effective assimilationist policies. And I'm like trying to fight those policies as I'm learning more. That was an incredibly mm, moving, yes, I want to say painful moment in the film when you make that statement I think you said literally I wrote it down because it just hit me you know I'm a saved man and a dead Indian Mm -hmm. you know I'm 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 basically it worked or whatever like here I am the result of that policy and you know you said something like I just don't know how to be with that and you know as someone myself I I'm not native um, but I through a series of twists and turns, which we were not going to go into now because it's not about me today. Uh, But I ended up in uh, getting a master's degree in American Indian Studies. And I remember being at the University of Arizona a long time ago and really grappling and trying to put my mind around the policies that this country 
had when they were trying to basically eradicate over and over native culture, native people. And it was devastating to learn about it and also devastating how little we teach the truth in our schools, just the boarding school policies, the abuse that went on there, all those things, right? And so when you said that, it just, all the all that, all that I've soaked in over the years working with tribes, what I've heard about historical trauma, what I've seen, what I've, you know, people have shared with me. I've just been in a lot of privilege to be in different communities and hearing what some of the issues have been. Not that long ago, people mm -hmm. literally growing up away from their homes, not being able to speak their language. And when you said that, it just was so intense. I mean, how 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 has that felt for you? Have you begun to reconcile? Because you said, I just don't know how to be with that. How is the process of being with that sort of, I grew up not even knowing anything about my culture at all. Yeah, it's, I, you know, I was in preparation for this conversation. I've been thinking a lot today and, you know, most days identity stuff, but um just so complicated there is the the way that I sit in my own understanding of how I relate to the world and how I relate to myself and how I relate to my children and my adoptive parents and my you know biological mother and and then there's the way that I am acutely aware of how I am perceived not because of the film and not because I'm a uh, an actor, but just as a person moving through the world, how I'm perceived. And what's really my hope is that at some point they feel like the same. I, I mean, I think that's what we all want, right? Adoptees and birth children, everybody. We all just want to feel like the same as how we are perceived. And that seems like a human thing. But but. I think that for me, there, there's, it's pretty discordant. It's pretty incongruous as a, as a, um, depending on who I talk to or where I look, it, it doesn't always match. You know, my adoptive family is incredibly supportive, like unbelievably supportive and loving and encouraging. And they, have not in any way even once stood in my way or asked aside from the one time my mom asked me not to find my birth mother when I was 18 but I'm still white in that space with them and and I think my my perception is that they just don't know how to come with me in this way. And I think it might be that it's too painful for them to, I mean, they had nothing to do with, they had everything to do with, but there was nothing intentional about my removal. I mean, I was, you know, my mother willingly gave me up for adoption, but they are also in some way, you know, complicit. And I think that's an awkward place for them to be. And then when I'm in native communities, I feel kind of like a three-legged dog that I'm seen as missing something very significant. But, you know, three-legged dogs get around great. <laughs> <laughs> and I've never had that fourth leg. So right. I don't know. I don't know, you know. It's really, it's it's still awkward. And I, I don't know how it sits other than to know that, you know, I my hope is that my children have, a different experience of of sort of straddling the worlds living wholly in both of them would be my my dream and i don't know that that's possible but that's that's certainly what i want for them i'm like nodding my head so much as i'm as i'm listening to it. i think like my neck's going <laughs> to going to have like whiplash <laughs> um you know i i relate so much to what you're sharing i i don't have the same exact story obviously i'm not native and i'm but i am half black and I was raised actually by a black man. My adoptive father was black and my adoptive mother was white, mirroring my biological parents. And my adoptive dad was very much someone who was a pioneer and broke a lot of barriers and therefore ended up, he was like a doctor in a white world in a white, mostly white city. And so I was just in a really white world. Mm -hmm. You know, he sent me to private schools. And I'm just saying all of this because what, you've, what you're what you describing 
I just relate to all of it. When you said it's a human experience, I do think it is also a human experience of wanting to have how people perceive you match internally how you feel. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm visibly look black. So there's often been issues, right? Like just yeah, showing up and, and people being like, well, you talk really white, you know, or whatever it is, right? So how has it been? I know for me finding my recently my large black biological family that is all here in the Seattle area, going to huge black barbecues and, you know, people like you described uh, walking up and just saying, oh, you're so-and-so's daughter. And so, you know, and love you. Like they love me. They love me already. And you talk about that in the documentary and I, it feels amazing to me, but it also sometimes I'm like, what is happening? And then I have to like that three-legged dog feeling like, am I acting appropriate? Like, I don't even know what I'm doing, you know? And do I want to try to play it off? Like, oh yeah, I grew up a black girl, you know? Um, it's like kind of sort of, well, not exactly, but I am, but I'm not, but well, everyone thinks I am. So when you went to Lummi, how did that how did that help? Or did it, like you said, sometimes you feel like a three-legged dog, but I saw that welcome. Well, I don't want to give away the whole documentary, but the point is <laughs> you were welcomed. And how has that, since the making of that film, since it ended, has that been integrated within you more? Like, yes, I really am part of this community now, or is it still a process? Oh, gosh. It's so <laughs> still a process. It's, I mean, I I am also acutely aware of the privilege that I have to have grown up in a very well-educated, you know, I, I have, I, I look white. I am very much white passing, not by choice, but this is, this is how it is. And also when I went back, I, I have been so generously welcomed and I feel like I have the privilege in all of those spaces I I know that that is not every adoptee's experience to walk back or you know to even have the access to finding their relatives and then to find the relatives and have them say welcome and we love you has been uh, it's also not everybody's experience and I am I, I feel so, so grateful for it. And also, it's been amazing because I I think partly because of the process of making the film and partly just because of the nature of the way that I learn, um, I came into it from a very academic space of like, I went context first and then personal. And when I got to Lummi the first time and the subsequent times that I've been back to visit, everybody wants to tell me who I am based on who the family is. And I don't know the people that they're telling me these stories about. I don't, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in hearing about the experience of whoever I'm talking, you know, the cousin or the aunt or the uncle that I'm speaking with and, and what their life is like and us getting to know one another. But my grandfather was a very, large personality in the community and um, somewhat maybe fraught personality, but, but huge physically and personality wise guy. And um, so, so showing up, even having never met him being his grandchild, there's a lot that comes with it. And I don't understand other than knowing that there's a lot, I don't know what the lot is and so that's been really weird and fun because people are excited to tell me stories about him and and there's some grief for sure about not having had an opportunity to meet him bodily but yeah i feel like i'm i'm digressing but these are these are thoughts and feelings that i have about going back and and how welcoming everybody has been just and i went you know the first time we went i had the cameras and we were there for a big festival called Stamish that's like the return of the warrior um, that was created for veterans coming back. And there are canoe races in the bay. And it's like this time that anyone who lives away from the res comes back and visits family during Stamish. And so it felt like a really appropriate time for me to come back for the first time. 
but I also had cameras. So I felt super conspicuous because I was this like strange girl wandering around with multiple cameras and like a boom hanging over my head. And it was weird. And then the next time I went back also with the cameras to enroll and was unable to enroll um, because I didn't have the right paperwork. I had my adoption birth certificate, but I didn't understand, like, of course, once I was in the room, of course, I would need my original birth certificate, but I didn't have it yet. So that was awkward because I I went to like the bureaucratic space of enrollment office and had to, you know, did a parentage test, which is not the same as a DNA test, but still like mouth swab thing and was told that I was not going to be able to enroll at that time because I had to get different paperwork. And then immediately after this like very uncomfortable rejection that because enrolling already felt really hard for me, I didn't want to do it until I felt like I understood what it meant to be Lummy. But At some point, I realized that I was maybe never going to like be able to say with certainty. So maybe as part of my process, I should uh, enroll and and start that journey. Was rejected in the enrollment office and then immediately went across the hall to um, another room in the tribal offices and the grandparents committee, which is like a committee of elders who are actively working to bring their children home. We screened the film for them and they held a ceremony for me in this conference room and wrapped me in a blanket and brought out a song that I have since been told is a song that is very rarely sung and is very, very powerful. Uh, And, and, that blanket they said you know you belong and no matter where you are in the world if you get confused you can wrap yourself in this blanket wow beautiful and know where you i have it right here i have the blanket and whenever i whenever i talk i try to have it nearby just in case i get too confused (laughs) love it it's beautiful yeah and and also that ceremony ended and everybody left the room and i my birth mother and i finished our crying And the cameras turned off and a young woman in the hallway came into the room and she had been in the screening and she was like, your, your story is really sparkly and I'm also adopted and nobody wrapped me in a blanket. And, um, and then she started talking and it was such a, an important conversation to to help me remember how much privilege I have and um, how important it is to to remember how hard this journey is and if it's like this hard for me surrounded by love welcomed with open arms every direction I look how much harder it would be if that was not the response yeah yeah thanks for sharing that yeah and I think um I know for me, uh, the watching watching the film, I had that sense too of just like the gift of when when your biological family community is welcoming, which I didn't really expect, I guess, because I had had some other bumps in the road earlier with another part of my family. But mm-hmm. it is really powerful, and it um, it's not everybody's experience, so. But I don't know about you, but for me, it helped having that privilege has brought about some integration for me. But it's a slow process. You know, it's always a slow process. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think I before before I had any reunion in my mind, it was always about finding the womb from which I came like that's I want to find the birth mother. And that was sort of like the only goal. And it was baffling to me and still is so funny looking back that like, of course, there were other relatives. It feels so similar to getting married and being like, I'm going to marry this person right here who I love and I choose to be with forever. 
And then you get married and then you're like, whoa, there's this whole other family dynamic that I got to deal with forever. And even if it's a great one, it's not something you anticipated necessarily going in or I didn't anyway. And fortunately, also another set of open arms in that in that in that respect as well. But also going back to Lemmy, I thought I was going to like see the land. And for me, it was very much about the land, very much about about finding um, or or having some opportunity to put my feet in that water and um, be with the trees. For some reason, the trees felt really, really, really important, those cedar trees. And that is very easy for me to to go and sit on the land. And I was completely unprepared, completely blindsided by the relatives in a beautiful way, but like totally unprepared for a whole other family and a whole other set of dynamics. Yeah. And that's been like a really interesting slow process because there's other people's feelings, too. It's not just mine, which I also am so egocentric. I was unprepared for anybody else to have feelings about it. Yeah, it's um, complicated, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just like yep. yeah, nodding, nodding and nodding. <laughs> well, and I also want to just touch one more time on just this piece, too, of as you're integrating, as you're learning, as you're realizing, oh, man, there's all these other people, too. And I have this widening circle of, you know, I've invited this huge by opening this door. My life has changed dramatically. And there's a lot of new people and there's a lot of new understanding. And I know you've talked about that historical trauma and that impact mm -hmm. and probably also connecting with the resilience. Right. And um, I just wondered, maybe just somewhat selfishly, as I am embarking on a lot of genealogy around my enslaved ancestors, you know, it's one thing to hear it in school or to, you know, understand there's been slavery, to hear the stories. It's already painful enough. But then when you start seeing your great uncles listed in a will being left with the pigs and the wagons to somebody else's property, it hits in a completely different way, right? Yeah. So as that widening happens and like love is coming in and acceptance is coming in and support and all these other pieces of truth and incredible challenge juxtaposed with my own personal privilege, how, how are you taking care of yourself in all of that as you navigate that? I've just wanted to know as we kind of get to the end of this convo. How, how do you take care of yourself with that? A lot of tears. So many tears. I've done a lot of dream work. Uh, I've found that that dreams have been some of the best ancestral healing that I've done. That That like before bed, if I open that door and ask very often, um, it is not completely resolved, but there's like a balm that can happen in that space. And still like so much anxiety and uncertainty around it to the, I mean, still just the, yeah, becoming aware of the historical trauma. I think also in the process of making the film, there were conversations that were had that I don't know if they ever would have occurred otherwise. Like, I don't know that many people who sit down and have a conversation with their mother, whether it's an, a birth mother reunion situation or not, um, where she says, and then I was raped for the last time. Um, I don't know. I mean, the access that I have partly by nature of the fact that my birth mother is like a gigantic, magnificent open book of a human being. And partly because we were making a film contextualizing our adoption experience, we, you know, met. And then two months later, we're sitting in the office of the National Indian Child Welfare Association having a conversation with Terry Cross, Terry Cross who wrote the Indian Child Welfare Act. And immediately learning about the historical trauma in a way that she and I had no prior knowledge of that the last what the last that that you know women were like routinely given full forced sterilizations when they went into hospitals to give birth up to the 70s the 1970s and we had no idea so 
you know, the, that trip was a mess and I had not zipped myself up well in preparation for it and really went home and was like, damn, I should have got some therapy before this. And so there was a year and a half, I think, of like undoing or not undoing, but like unpacking and feeling and would definitely highly recommend anyone who is doing ancestral work who has any kind of severing from ancestral lineage to get some skills to figure out how to zip yourself up when you go into those spaces so that you can take on at a reasonable rate what's coming because it it's I mean, yeah, it's real. It's hard. And I think, you know, we don't know what's coming. And so when we don't know what's coming, it's 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 not about like going in with our dukes up, right? Like ready to fight it off. It's just learning how to be soft. And also I, I had a, I'm a yoga teacher. I had a student a couple of years ago say, talk about preserving her peace as she's also native and that when she is walking into potentially like challenging spaces that before she steps into them, she just reminds herself to preserve her peace and it helps with the decision making about how much to let in or how to engage. And I, gosh, I don't think a day goes by that I don't think about preserving my peace or like, how can I do that while I am also doing this work? And how can the work that I'm doing for myself in this time be also work that is benefiting my community, both my adoptive family and the, you know, my community of origin and certainly my children and grandchildren so that some circles can be come back around um, in, in ways that are loving and not creating more that needs repairing down the road. Beautiful. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. And I think just, you know, wrapping this part up on that note of preserving, preserving our peace, preserving your peace. Cause I think regardless of the specific stories or the communities we're reconnecting with or the, or even the one birth parent or, or even not able to connect with a birth parent, um, whatever that is for adoptees, there's so much complexity and there's so much, unpacking, as you said, to do, and so much that comes up that's very old and sometimes not even really understood that's coming from a very deep place and even maybe coming from our ancestors, right, through their DNA in our bodies um, and their old mem- their memories, you know, all that's coming up, it's like, how can we find the anchor? How can we preserve our peace? And I think mm-hmm. that's a beautiful kind of message mm-hmm. to find that for mm-hmm. ourselves, right, as we do this incredible journey that's called being an adoptee. <laughs> Mm -hmm. (laughs) Okay, so I could talk to you forever, but let's get into um, recommended resources. Thank you so much for sharing everything you have today. I, of course, am going to recommend for my recommended resource. I'm not a surprise. I'm going to recommend the documentary that you're in, Daughter of a Lost Bird. And I know that it's not like widely out there. Maybe you can um, say how to access or is is there a place to kind of follow and sign up to find out about screenings? etc. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have a website, daughteroflossbird.com and an Instagram at daughteroflossbirddoc. And it will be widely available in May of 2022 on America Reframed. It'll have its national broadcast through PBS. So between now and then we're in festival circuit land. So it may be coming to a film festival near you. <laughs> right. And I highly recommend it. I literally was transfixed. It was very powerfully put together. As I said before, it just really impacted me as an adoptee and just as someone who also thinks it's so important to understand the history and context um, for the Native people in this country. I just think all of it was woven together so beautifully. So that's my big recommendation. Um, would you like to share your uh, recommended resource? Thank you. Yeah, uh, there's well, there are are several other films that we have drawn heavily from and been in cahoots with in some capacity. One is a film called Dawnland 
that I highly recommend, um, which is about the first Truth and Reconciliation Committee in the United States about a community in relationship to their town. And I highly, I think that was an absolutely beautiful film. I learned a ton. Also, Blood Memory, which is a documentary about Sandy Whitehawk, another Native adoptee. I highly recommend that one as well. The Body Keeps the Score. That sweet Bessel van der Kolk, I absolutely adore. There is a book that we just started reading, my daughter and I, called I Can Make This Promise. And it's by Christine Day. Um, And it is a young adult book about a native adoptee or a a young girl whose mother is adopted. And it's set in Seattle and it is an excellent book. My daughter and I started reading it and she was like, Mama, this book is like about us. This is like our life. And it's this um, it was this incredible opportunity to understand the value of representation and um, how how significant it was for her to be the child of an ad- of an adoptee and watching her mom go through all of the confusion of who am i it's an it's an excellent excellent book for for parents like adoptees who are parents of birth children wow sounds amazing yeah thank you for sharing that and i feel like there's more and more my embodiment practices have been imperative in um, processing and integrating to just have any kind of practices that are bringing us back into the present moment and into the physical body that we are so lucky to inhabit, um, even with whatever has happened to the body, it's still the house we get to live in. So um, yeah, uh, Bessel van der Kolk, I love and my boss in a practice. I mean, that's not my resource. That is my resource, not your <laughs> right. resource. But I highly recommend looking for some kind of a somatic experiencing or yoga or qigong or some other kind of movement practice that is intentional and mindful. Thank you for that, too. Yeah, I found personally my uh, meditation practice very grounding, and very helpful. Mm-hmm. A place in which I can take refuge. So thank you for sharing all of your um, insights. Thank you again so much for being on the show and for sharing your story and about your incredible documentary. And thank you again for making that documentary, for being willing to share that journey. And it's been such an honor speaking with you today. Well, thank you so much, Lisette. It's really been a, a gift to have a chance to talk about it in this way. Hey, it's Haley again. I got to see Daughter of a Lost Bird in the fall of 2021. And I'll just echo Lizette's recommendation. What a beautifully shot documentary. Extremely moving. I think it perfectly captures much of the adoptee experience and has tremendous insights into the experience of Indigenous adoptees. What a generous film. I also have been reading Christine Day's book, I Can Make This Promise with My Kids, and I'm so glad Kendra mentioned it. I've got links to everything Lizette and Kendra mentioned for recommended resources in the show notes for this episode. I do hope you follow at Daughter of a Lost Bird Doc on Instagram to make sure you keep up with the film. You can follow Lizette Austin over on Instagram at Traveling My Roots, and I've got links to her website and newsletter in the show notes for you too. I want to thank my Patreon supporters for making these episodes of Adoptees On possible. If you'd like to join them, you can go to adopteeson.com slash community to find out all the benefits of supporting the show, including another weekly podcast, Adoptees Off Script, and monthly book club, Adoptees Only. This month, we're reading Bastards by Mary Anna King. Thanks for listening. Let's talk again next Friday. 